We are going to be talking about uh, blood pressure, and uh, this is going to be introducing our unit on homeostasis. And the reason why we are uh, talking about homeostasis and blood pressure is because it provides a great example uh, of what, combining what you already know with what we want you to learn from this course. And uh, so there'll be some stuff you already know, uh, and then some stuff we're going to learn. And we're going to show you some levels of detail that you may not understand initially here, uh, but as the school year goes on. Um, and you get different experiences, you should be able to put this all together. So this is kind of an introduction uh, and a preview. So you probably have seen the uh, blood pressure cuffs uh, at the doctor's office or in the uh, you know the Walmart or the pharmacy. You maybe stick your arm in there and read the cuff. And you didn't really know what it was doing other than it was squeezing your arm really, uh, really tightly. But it's basically there to uh, to measure blood pressure, and uh, it is measuring it uh, in a brachial artery. And uh, basically, what it's doing is it's squeezing the blood from the uh, artery. It's compressing the artery, and then it releases the artery, uh, and uh, it's going to be making some noise that you can see right here. And that noise is what we actually measuring on the, or that we can hear through the um, stethoscope. And that is what we're measuring for uh, our testing of your blood pressure. So that's what you do. And you can see here that we are only able to measure the um, blood pressure in the arteries. There is no measurable blood pressure in veins. Uh, and there is a little blood pressure in capillaries, but capillaries are so distributed we can't find them anywhere. So the only place we can actually measure, actually measure your blood pressure is in your arteries. Now, we're talking about homeostasis, and we're going to come up with this phrase uh, called homeostatic control mechanisms. And uh, basically, this is going to allow us to control uh, any particular homeostatic variable. In the case we're talking about today, it is um, blood pressure. And it's important to keep blood pressure normal uh, or near normal. Uh, we do not want to be uh, imbalanced, either too low or too high. Both of those would be abnormal. And you can see here that uh, there are going to be some stimuli that are going to cause a change. Um, you may feel a change in blood pressure uh, if you get really nervous or scared about something. And uh, um, that can cause a change in your blood pressure. And that's a stimulus. And then you're going to have receptors that are going to uh, detect that change. And then they are going to send that information to the integrating or control center. In most cases, that control center is going to be the brain or some particular part of the brain. And then the brain or that control center is going to respond. And they're going to respond in a way which is going to cause the blood vessels or the uh, um, that change to go move in the opposite direction. So it's kind of like a teeter-totter, you know, a uh, seesaw. And we're trying to keep the seesaw like this, but we can never always keep it like this. So sometimes it's going to be down, sometimes it's going to be up. But homeostatic control systems are going to try and through the systems that we have, keep it at a uh, as close to level as possible. So homeostasis and blood pressure. And it's pretty simple from the beginning. Uh, blood pressure is simply a uh, uh, measure of the diameter of the blood vessel and the volume of the blood. Those are the two factors that are going to affect blood pressure. So from the beginning, it's pretty simple. It's just that we're going to add a whole lot of elements to it. But when we do talk about blood pressure, we're simply talking about two basic physics properties. The diameter of the tube, the larger the tube is, the lower the blood pressure, and the volume. The greater the volume of blood there is uh, pushing against it, the higher the blood pressure is going to be. The lower the volume, the lower the blood pressure. Right? So if the blood pressure is out of balance, um, like we saw on the last screen there, uh, if it's low, then we have something called hypotension. And if it's high, we have something called hypertension. Now, the difference between hypo, which is the, uh, uh, the low one, and hyper, which is the high one, is hypo is immediately life-threatening. Um, if you have low blood pressure for any period of time at all, um, it can cause something like uh, fainting, but it can also cause kidney failure. Um, a primary contributor to the hypotension is dehydration, which in the summer times in Georgia we get all the time. And uh, it is uh, something that is immediately life-threatening. So if you go um, and see somebody who gets shot, um, they're going to be losing lots of blood. Their blood volume is going to be dropping. As a result of that, their blood pressure is going to be dropping. They're going to fall into hypotension. So um, em emergency responders are first and foremost um, worried about your blood pressure when they uh, come upon the scene of somebody who is uh, unconscious. Do they have any blood pressure? And the second thing, you know, do they, obviously, do they have a they have a heart rate? 
Now on the other end of that is hypertension, and hypertension is high blood pressure, and hypertension is not an immediate problem. You are going to be hypertensive um, if you drink a, a large amount of caffeine in a very short period of time. Uh, it doesn't mean you have high blood pressure permanently, it's just the effect of the caffeine. And uh, you can have hypertension um, for long periods of time uh, before it really does anything. So uh, with hypertension, what we're really worried about is the long-term effects of it. And so uh, it has major health consequences, and uh, one of those health consequences is uh, a stroke. You can have a stroke if you have hypertension um, chronically. So again, uh, start out with something very simple, and then we're going to move to uh, some more complex ideas. Some of this stuff you already know, like hypertension. Some of this stuff, like hypotension, you probably didn't know. All right, so blood pressure. Uh, can also be influenced by your level of physical activity and it can also be influenced by your diet so those of you with a, uh, a very poor diet and low levels of physical activity can expect over time uh, to have a higher risk of having high blood pressure and we also know that people who, who do have high blood pressure so you go into the doctor and the doctor's like hey I've diagnosed you with high blood pressure um, they're gonna say first let's change your lifestyle and they do that by talking about changing your level of physical activity uh, and improving your diet and uh, so that's another contributor to blood pressure so it's not just about you know the, again the, the volume and the uh, uh, diameter but these things the physical activity and the diet will affect both the uh, primarily the, the diameter of the blood vessels all right, so the blood itself, um, which is contributing to the blood volume, you know you have about five liters of blood, uh, and the blood itself is actually broken up into two parts, the cells and the plasma. The cells are the, uh, the, the solid parts of it, and the plasma is the fluid that the blood travels in. Of those two, the plasma is the one which is most variable. And the plasma is most variable because um, it's going to be losing water, it's going to be losing fluid to the cells, uh, and then it's going to be gaining fluid from uh, what you, you intake uh, through your diet. Now, we talked about the via diameter of the blood vessels, and of course you know that there's three kinds of blood vessels, arteries, capillaries, and veins, and we already said earlier that arteries are the ones that we're going to be measuring blood pressure in, uh, capillaries and veins we will not be measuring blood pressure in. Um, we will not spend a whole lot of time talking about uh, capillaries and veins the rest of this section, but when we get to the cardiovascular system we definitely will. Alright, so the cardiovascular system itself is made up of the heart and the vessels. The heart is the pump, uh, and then the vessels are going to be the tubes by which it, stuff moves through there. All right. So your blood vessels are part of a larger system, the cardiovascular system. Obviously we'll spend quite a bit of time talking about that one uh, and doing some, some pretty cool activities. Now the cardiovascular system itself is then influenced by the nervous system. And uh, you know that uh, um, there are things which can cause your heart rate to go up uh, even when you're not doing anything. Like let's say you're trying to ask somebody out on a date. Um, it's pretty nerve-wracking. And is she going to say yes? Will he say, you know, uh, what's he going to do? How's he going to respond? Uh, what did he say? How did he say it? Um, all those things are uh, generated in your brain, but they're going to have a physical effects on your body. Uh, and they may cause your heart rate, even though you're not doing anything, they may cause your heart rate to, uh, uh, to change. Or you could be meditating and you could actually get your heart rate to lower. And so the nervous system does affect the cardiovascular system. And the endocrine system also affects the cardiovascular system. Uh, you have probably heard of adrenaline, and adrenaline is a uh, hormone. Uh, its, its scientific name is epinephrine, and it has the effect of speeding up the heart rate, uh, increasing, the, increasing the blood pressure. So it has effects on blood vessels and on the heart um, that it's going to be uh, uh, things which are going to affect uh, your blood pressure. So uh, if your level of epinephrine is high, like let's say you almost got in a car accident, you're going to see your levels of epinephrine uh, rise uh, rapidly, and you're going to see an increase in heart rate and blood pressure. ADH is another hormone, uh, and it affects blood volume. It's called antidiuretic hormone, and what it does is it makes you pee less. And if it makes you pee less, then what it's going to do is it's going to keep more blood inside your blood vessels, or more blood plasma inside your blood vessels, and that's going to keep your blood volume up. Um, it's released high amounts when you're, when you're dehydrated. All right, so the nervous system, like we saw in the homeostatic control mechanisms, requires receptors. The kinds of receptors we're talking about are baroreceptors. Uh, if you are looking at your body, um, if you're along your neck right here, you're going to see baroreceptors uh, that are going to be pressure receptors in your uh, carotid arteries. 
right here and they are going to be uh, um, responding to changes in pressure so as the changes in pressure increase uh, they're going to generate a nervous system signal if they decrease uh, then they're also going to generate a signal um, in a different direction that's going to tell the uh, the brain uh, it'll cause a different response by the brain to affect the cardiovascular system to affect the blood pressure uh, to uh, change the signal that's coming from the receptors so the nervous system uh, communicates outside, so it's got uh, receptors going in, it's got nerves going out, um, and the specific example of that would be like a cranial nerve such as a vagus nerve, and the vagus nerve is going to affect your, your blood pressure, and if you've ever fainted before and somebody said, hey, why did you faint? And you said, oh, I have no idea, uh, it's very likely that it was a drop in blood pressure that was caused by the vagus nerve sending an inappropriate signal. Um, syncope is the scientific word for fainting, uh, and if we don't know what kind of fainting it is, it's called idiopathic syncope, uh, and the most common effect of the common reason for that is the, uh, the vagus nerve uh, sending out an inappropriate signal. We don't really know why that happens, but that's part of the, uh, the system we're talking about. So it again affects the heart and the blood vessels and the cardiovascular system. So head back here, we've already talked about these guys and the endocrine system and talked about the ADH earlier uh, is uh, going to be released and it's going to travel to the kidneys it's going to keep the kidneys from uh, uh, absorbing some of the fluid that's found in the blood uh, and it's going to return it uh, the fluid back to the blood more fluid back to the blood so it's going to maintain your blood volume so again if you're dehydrated um, then ADH is going to be released in large amounts your urine volume is going to be lower as a result of that and your blood pressure will be your blood volume will be maintained because you're going to lose less plasma all right so there's a quick summary of everything we've talked about and I know it's pretty fast for you um, but that is uh, stuff that you're going to be able to know by the end of the year so at the beginning of the year maybe you knew this stuff down here um, you know about physical activity and diet maybe have a parent or a grandparents being treated for blood pressure um, maybe you know a little bit about homeostasis uh, you probably heard of hypertension um, you probably know about the arteries the capillaries and the veins and uh, the uh, heart of course you know about you probably heard of the endocrine system and uh, you know adrenaline that kind of thing so there's some stuff in here you've seen some stuff in here you haven't seen and uh, what we want to do here is kind of just put it all together for you in a big picture and then we're going to kind of break it down look at the different parts so at the end of the year you know you really have a solid understanding of this so why do we care about blood pressure uh, obviously homeostasis is the reference but there's also going to be a health component to this as well so a lot of you guys want to know hey what's my normal blood pressure well normal blood pressure uh, you know a typical one is going to be 120 over 80 is what you're going to say is normal but really um, the systolic here which is the high number uh, that can be as low as 90 so anywhere between 90 and uh, about 130 uh, is normal uh, and then the diastolic anything 60 to uh, about 80 85 is normal so those, there's a range of normal it's just one number for normal so if you get 110 over 70 am I normal you're normal and if I get uh, 90 over 70 am I normal you're normal so it's not just 120 over 80 um, now you can be hypertensive um, if you're starting to creep towards the one upper 130s uh, or at uh, around you know eight, above 85 uh, 90 uh, and then if we measure you constantly you're 140 over 90 and I have had high school seniors who have measured 140 over 90 and we've had high school freshmen that we've measured over uh, that have high blood pressure and this is not something that is uh, unusual uh, for older people um, but it is unusual for younger people but if you do have hypertension uh, when you're young that's going to be something you want to to talk to your doctor about and again just one measurement uh, is not mean you're hypertensive because lots of stuff can affect it um, but if you are hypertensive normally or chronically you is you do want to get it taken care of uh, treated so uh, in the United States uh, there's about 67 million people about 30 percent of the population who are hypertensive uh, but only about a little less than half of those are controlled through medication diet exercise that whole deal and the, more than half are not of those who are not 
14 percent, uh, 14 million, uh, don't even know they have it. And it's uh, the silent killer, and the reason why it's silent killer is because you don't really feel bad if your blood pressure is 140 over 90. It's just that it's going to cause extreme or extra wear and tear on your body that over time is going to make uh, um, have some severe health effects. Some people know about it but don't do anything about it, and some people know about it, are treated, and are still not controlled. Um, so the majority, majority of people do not know they're hypertensive, um, and even if they do know, it does not mean that they uh, um, are taking steps to control it. Now, I told you before that it's uh, it's bad long term, uh, and it can cause things like a stroke, uh, arteriosclerosis, um, heart attack, or kidney failure. Those are the uh, kinds of things which can cause mortality. Um, this is uh, us in Woodstock right up here. Cherokee County is not severely high in high blood pressure, uh, but you can see Georgia's got some counties that are pretty high. Um, and this is mortality rate from hypertension, so that 50% or more that are you know untreated or uncontrolled, um, they're going to be the ones that are going to suffer uh, um, uh, death as a result of it. Uh, and at a, at a fairly high rate, and these dark red ones here is 200. 2.64, 264 out of 100,000, so it's a, it's a pretty high amount. Um, now compare us to the rest of the country, uh, and you can see here that in the southeast, um, we got a pretty large number of counties where we have high levels of hypertension. Um, if you're one of the lowest levels of hypertension, looks like you want to move to Colorado. All right. um, but you can see here that it's a, it is a widespread problem, not just limited to uh, um, you know, one area of the country um, or one particular group of people.